There are many kinds of explanations that are not held in high regard by science, even though they may have large followings and many anecdotes affirming their truth. Chief among these being appeals to the supernatural, miracles, or religious sources. In order to explain why these explanations are not held in high regard by science, I will use an allegory to explain what is generally understood as the scientific method. I hope this allegory is straightforward and compelling enough to be able to be used as a means to articulate the values of science at all levels of discourse. There are infinitely many ways to explain anything. Suppose we see a cup fall over. What could have caused this to happen? Maybe the wind knocked it over, or maybe somebody bumped the table it was sitting on. Maybe it was caused by a mouse, a squirrel, or a bird. Or perhaps a meteorite falling from the sky, or invisible aliens. Maybe even someone used psychic powers to knock it over, or magic. It could have been a ghost, a fairy, a leprechaun, or even a god that knocked it over. It is even possible that the entire world was created five minutes ago with the cup already laying on its side, and the memories of seeing it fall are illusory. Or maybe the world was created six minutes ago. Seven? We can continue to come up with possible explanations of the cup's current predicament ad infinitum, but how do we tell which of these infinite many possibilities is the best explanation? There needs to be some criteria we can use to differentiate between explanations that are just made up in our heads and explanations that are justifiable beliefs about what caused the event. The correct explanation should be able to explain everything about the event, the things that preceded it, the current state of affairs, and those that will follow. Using ad hoc or post hoc reasoning, all explanations can explain everything about the event from the past and what we see in the present. Therefore, we must look to the future, namely, future predictions. For example, suppose my explanation was that a mouse knocked over the cup. I could make the future prediction that we will see mouse droppings inside and around the cup. If we discover the presence of said evidence, would this prove that my explanation was correct and all the others were false? No, it could be the case that a mouse did enter the cup and leave behind the incriminated evidence, but left the cup without knocking it over. Or maybe a devious fairy used magic to leave the incriminated evidence behind to make it appear as if a mouse was to blame. So clearly, any explanation can use post hoc or ad hoc reasoning to explain all of the evidence we observe in the past or from the present. Likewise, imagine it was the case that we did not discover any mouse droppings around the cup. Would that prove my explanation false? No, it could be the case that a mouse did knock over the cup, but left no incriminating evidence behind, or it did leave the evidence behind, though it was just blown away by the wind. Just as explanations can use post hoc or ad hoc reasoning to explain the presence of any evidence, they can also explain the lack of any evidence. Therefore, in order for something to be the best explanation, it has to do something more. It has to be able to explain or predict something in the future that we don't know yet. If we always choose to adopt the explanation with the most predictive power, with each new explanation we adopt, we will get ever closer to an explanation that can explain everything about the event. It doesn't matter how beautiful the alternative explanations are, nor how simple, nor how much else they could potentially explain. If they don't make predictions, they are inferior to those that do. No matter how many successful predictions any explanation makes, it is always possible that in the future a different explanation will be discovered that has even greater predictive power. Until a solution for this predicament is found, we must be happy to accept the best explanation tentatively without overextending and believing it is the absolutely correct explanation, lest we fall into dogmatism. If no known explanation makes future predictions, we prioritize explanations that are combinations of things that have already been demonstrated to be able to make future predictions over explanations that incorporate things that have not been demonstrated to make successful future predictions. For example, if we see a cup fall over, we prioritize explanations like the wind, humans, or mice, which have been able to make future predictions in the past, over explanations that have not, such as fairies, magic, miracles, or the supernatural. If multiple explanations make the same future predictions, we prioritize the simpler explanation. This is not because simplicity is indicative of truth, but rather, if they make the same predictions, we may as well use the one that takes less time and effort to do the predicting. This allegory of the cup that I have illustrated outlines the values of science. Because verified predictions do not prove an explanation correct, and falsified predictions do not prove an explanation incorrect, we can never know which explanation is absolutely correct and which are absolutely incorrect. Because of this fact, the words correct and incorrect have come to mean something very different in science than what they mean colloquially. Colloquially, we think of the correct explanation as the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter. However, in science, because we have no way to apprehend what the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter is, the correct explanation simply refers to the explanation that has the most predictive power. 
We may refer to these two senses of the term correct as the metaphysical correctness or metaphysical truth of the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter and the methodological correctness or the methodological truth of the best explanation that has the most predictive power. Any explanation is metaphysical if it is asserted as a stopping point for truth that cannot potentially be overturned, making it absolute rather than tentative and therefore distinct from the methodological tier. Also, it's important to note that there's a difference between claiming an explanation has the status of being an ontological stopping point for truth and claiming to have the epistemological grounds of absolute certainty to justify such a claim. This does not only apply to fallen cups, but to anything and everything. The origin of the universe, the origin of species, the diversity of species, the apparent fine-tuning of the universe, anything and everything. All phenomena, individually and collectively, that comprise the past and present state of reality can all be explained by infinitely many mutually exclusive explanations. Therefore, in order to determine which of these is the best explanation, we use the criterion of prediction outlined in the allegory of the cup. The predictions an explanation must make to be the best explanation can't just be any predictions. For example, I can make a prediction that I said was verified by me and my friends in my backyard. Unfortunately, you aren't there and you can't verify the prediction. Due to the fact that the proponents of any of the explanations can all use this same tactic means it is not sufficient to determine which is the best explanation. Therefore, the predictions must be repeatable. Also, I can make the prediction that if my explanation is correct, there will be a man named Bob standing off in that direction. If you look in that direction and do not see Bob, I can simply say, he is farther off in that direction, you have to travel farther before you will see him. And I can repeat this line ad infinitum, no matter how far you travel, without finding Bob. Again, any explanation can use this tactic. Therefore, to qualify as the best explanation, the predictions must be falsifiable. Also, I can make the prediction that the sun will rise tomorrow if my explanation is correct. Any explanation can make predictions of things that are already commonplace expectations of what's going to happen in the future. Therefore, this does not give us a way to determine which is the best explanation. Therefore, to be the best explanation, the predictions must be novel, meaning something we don't already anticipate. Also, I can make the prediction that exactly one billion light years from here is a teapot floating in space. Again, any explanation can make predictions that we can't actually verify. Therefore, to determine the best explanation, the predictions must be verifiable. Also, I could just make many random predictions, and some will inevitably turn out to be correct. Again, anyone can use this tactic. Therefore, it is not sufficient to determine the best explanation. Similarly, I can make many predictions that can be interpreted in numerous ways, such as parables or symbolism. Any explanation can use parables or symbolism to make vague predictions that can be post-talk interpreted as having predicted an event well after the event has occurred, due to the fact that such parables and symbolism can be interpreted in numerous ways. Therefore, in order for an explanation to be the best, the predictions it makes must be precise. And finally, even if I'm able to make numerous predictions that fit all of the previous criteria, I may be using a different explanation than the one I have accredited. Therefore, others must independently be able to use the same explanation to make such predictions, meaning they have to be confirmed by peer review. In conclusion, in order to qualify as the best explanation, it must be able to make predictions that are repeatable, falsifiable, novel, verifiable, precise predictions that must be confirmed by peer review. This allegory of the scientific method demonstrates why science doesn't hold many explanations in high regard, even though they may have large followings and many anecdotes affirming their truth. Chief among these being appeals to the supernatural. A common misconception about science is that it a priori excludes the supernatural as possible explanations. However, this is false. Science simply prioritizes natural explanations because those have been demonstrated to make successful predictions in the past, whereas supernatural explanations have not. This is the difference between metaphysical naturalism and methodological naturalism. Metaphysical naturalism is the position that there is no supernatural world, whereas methodological naturalism is the position that there is no evidence of the supernatural world, and so we'd have no reason to believe in it for the time being. Like appeals to the supernatural, appeals to religious experience are another example of explanations that are not held in high regard by science. Many religious apologists argue that their preferred supernatural agent can act as an explanation for many things that science has not yet explained. For example, a metaphysical or objective basis of morality, purpose, value, free will, consciousness, intelligibility, rationality, origin of the universe, math, logic, or value. 
Because science is always tentative or methodological, it doesn't even attempt to provide metaphysical or objective solutions for any of these. Though science does attempt to provide tentative methodological explanations of these things. The reason science doesn't even attempt to make a metaphysical or objective explanation of any of these is because just like in the allegory of the cup, there are infinitely many ways to explain anything and there is no way to apprehend the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter. So anything that is asserted as a metaphysical explanation may itself be explained by some greater explanation that we just don't know about, thereby reverting it back to the methodological tier. For example, if a god existed, there is no way to demonstrate it was not itself created by another greater god. And simply defining an explanation as not potentially having an explanation of its own is again a tactic that any of the other explanations can also use. For example, by saying God is by definition a being that was not created, a naturalistic pantheism could say the universe is by definition a thing that was not created. Therefore, until we have a way to apprehend the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter, all metaphysical assertions are unsupported. In addition, just like the fallen cup, infinitely many explanations can be used to explain any of these apparent metaphysical phenomena. For example, instead of being grounded in theism, objective morality can be grounded in deism, pantheism, naturalistic pantheism, which is atheism, panpsychism, a cosmism, transtheism, henotheism, postafarianism, or an evil god, just to name a few. For example, scientists could assert there is an objective basis of morality grounded in naturalistic pantheism as a super law of nature, simply one we haven't discovered yet. As I noted earlier, any explanation can use ad hoc reasoning to explain any phenomenon. Therefore, science is equally capable as theism of asserting explanations for these apparent metaphysical phenomena. However, science avoids doing this because all metaphysical phenomena are unsupported until we find a way to discover or apprehend the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter, thereby limiting all explanations to the methodological tier, in which none of these metaphysical hypotheses make any successful future predictions. Therefore, none are any better than any of the others we can just make up. In the last part of this video, I'd like to address a few common criticisms I've heard of this position. A dissident may protest that I have presented a principle that requires explanations to be repeatable, falsifiable, etc. Yet, does my principle itself meet this set of criteria? The principle I have presented is a conceptual metric for determining which explanation of an event should be preferred, but it is not itself an explanation of an event, therefore it does not apply to itself nor would it apply to any other internal conceptual metrics that also are not explanations of events, such as math, logic, or language. Conceptual metrics have their own criteria for determining which are to be preferred, contingent upon the field in which they are being used. This can be understood as a distinction between conceptual methodology and empirical methodology. The conceptual methodology is concerned with conceptual metrics and where they are applicable. This is distinct from the empirical methodology, which is the application of a particular set of conceptual metrics. For example, the difference between the philosophy of science and the application of the natural and applied sciences. Another common criticism I've heard is that a dissident will protest, is your criteria truly repeatable and falsifiable? If by truly, the dissident means absolutely and irrefutably, then the answer is no, nor do they need to be. If an explanation were presented as the absolute irrefutable truth of the matter, then it would need absolute irrefutable evidence to support such a claim. As science is only making tentative claims about reality, it only requires tentative evidence. If an explanation was asserted to be absolutely and irrefutably repeatable, it would need to be repeated at all points of space throughout all time. Clearly, we lack the means to demonstrate that anything is absolutely and irrefutably repeatable. However, this is only a problem if an explanation is asserted as absolutely and irrefutably repeatable. If you only assert an explanation as tentatively repeatable, then it only needs to be repeated as often as the experiment is performed. The same reason applies to all the other criteria as well. Another common criticism is when a dissident would protest, this is just your arbitrary principle. What reason do we have to accept such a principle? The purpose of this principle is to differentiate between imaginary explanations that we've just made up in our head and justified explanations about what's reasonable to believe about what actually caused the event. The ability to filter out imaginary explanations is clearly important, and to the best of my knowledge, the principle of predictions does this better than any other. Therefore, we have really good reason to accept the principle of predictions.